Hi, I'm Dave Fornell, the editor of Imaging Technology News Magazine, and we're here at RSNA 2014 in Chicago. I have with me contributing editor Greg Fryer, uh, who's had many years' experience coming to RSNA since the early 1980s, and uh, we wanted to go through some of the trends and key news that we've seen at this year's RSNA. Um, one of the things that we've seen over the last couple of years has really been a, a change at RSNA to where it's becoming a, increasingly an IT show. Yeah. And uh, there's also been a fundamental change in PACs in the last couple of years. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the changes that you're seeing here uh, in the traditional PACs. Well, if you take a look at PACs as we've seen in the past, you know, it, your IT companies have come in and provided PACs. <laughs> You've also had film companies come in and provide PACs as well. And it was natural progression for each side to be in there because really that was the information side of their business uh, for the IT, IT. And then, of course, film was the storage business for film companies. And what you're seeing now is when you get into the PAC side of things, you're really looking at enterprise imaging. So it has to go across the allergies. It has to go through these silos. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you look at the interchange of data, you're looking at standards and you're looking at the ability to archive them. And neutrality is very important. So not surprisingly, uh, a lot of emphasis being placed this show on vendor neutral archives and XDS interchanges. And sometimes you find both of those combined. So what you look at then are uh, you, you look at the kinds of, of viewers, universal viewers, that are necessary in order to make take advantage of these kinds of archives. Uh, you look at the way that data can be stored efficiently and distributed efficiently. So these are the things that really matter. And honestly, I think that what you're seeing is there are a lot more PAX companies that will probably be showing up at the HIMSS conference because mm -hmm. you're dealing with an audience of CIOs. Uh, primarily at HIMSS, and more and more, this is the way that this market is going. The radiologist's influence, particularly as has to do with information technologies, is giving way to, to the chief information officers that are having more influence in those institutions. The advent of the VNA, we saw at HIMSS earlier this year, um, and really it's probably going to be the future of PACs. Uh, everything's going to go to a central archive, and as you had mentioned, the different ologies. Uh, Cleveland Clinic recently went to a VNA, and I think they have uh, upwards of 52 departments that now contribute images, uh, including departments that never even knew produced images. <laughs> uh, and with the VNA, uh, several of the end users that I'm talking to and also some of the vendors I've talked to here on the floor today, uh, they talk about the VNA really being an anchor point. So you have to have a starting point of where you're going to uh, build your Christmas tree and hang your ornaments. Yeah. And uh, the, the term deconstructing packs is something that's come up several times uh, at this RSNA that I've never heard before. But it's the uh, taking the concept of your silo uh, for your packs where you have a, a viewing system and your work list and your storage and breaking all those pieces apart. And with the VNA, it really enables you to go and pull, well, I really like this company's viewer. I really like this company's work list. I really like this company's VNA. And be able to cherry pick the pieces to build your own system. Let's segue a little bit to some of the imaging modalities. Uh, one of the hottest topics here at RSNA 2014 is tomosynthesis, uh, 3D mammography. And uh, Hologic introduced its uh, Selenia system a couple years ago. Uh, there's a lot of excitement around that. There's been uh, a huge quantity of data that's uh, been built up uh, showing 3D mammography is uh, more efficient at uh, detecting tumors than uh, standard 2D. Uh, we just had a release with GE uh, releasing a Seneclair system at this show. Well, if you take a look at this, very interesting because you have a pioneer, and that is Hologic, and they have over 2,000 installed systems worldwide. Mm -hmm. The real key here is that you have new competitors entering the marketplace. First off is Santa Clara with that is being provided by GE. And this has gotten through the CE mark over a year ago, and earlier this year has gotten the FDA approval. And the key point here is that now you have two companies in the U.S. market that are selling 3D mammography units that are very very uh, capable units. Uh, a third is going to be coming not too long in the future because Siemens has gone in with an FDA approval um, application. So you see now that potentially you'd have three different competitors in there. So this is really heating up and I think that when you look at this it's going to be partly a marketing battle that's going to create a buzz that I think can cause this area to start to really start to move. Yeah, I, I think we're already starting to see a little bit of that marketing battle. Some of the banners unveiled in both GE and Hologic's booth as of today. So. Oh yeah. Well you see a checklist mm -hmm. and uh, the checklist appeared in the Hologic booth and, and uh, down one side was all Hologic and then only one check on the GE side. Mm -hmm. And of course you have to look at the way that this is how it's written. You have to be you know, you're never going to hear the whole story from either of these vendors or any of the three vendors when Siemens come on, comes on board. You've got to really compile this information. And uh, another advent that we've seen on the show floor uh, over the course of this year and here in ours today is uh, advent of uh, 
proliferation of hybrid imaging systems. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. If you take a look at what we've seen, you know, it's been a progression. Uh, PET-CT came on in the, in the 2002, 2003 time frame, really took control of the marketplace, grew very rapidly. Uh, you had SPEC-CT come out in, in really uh, the first diagnostic products came out maybe two or three years after that, but didn't really catch on, but now they really are catching on. Uh, more spec CTs are being sold now than there are spec units alone. Uh, and in 2010, we saw PET MR from uh, both Siemens as an integrated unit and from Philips. And now at this RSNA, you're seeing a PET MR coming from, uh, the, from GE. Well, Toshiba had two innovations. Uh, earlier this year at the Society of Nuclear Medicine, uh, they made their appearance with a PET CT system to, to get into the game along with their competitors with the other uh, big imaging companies that are out there. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, they, they also introduced uh, their interventional radiology uh, slash angiography slash CT system yeah. to where they have a CT system that's based within the cath lab that could be pulled in on rails over the patient on the table to do a uh, CT scan. And then they could pull it back instead of just relying on a rotational angiography 3D imaging. You get much more detail with the CT scanner itself. Right, and, uh, and what they're looking at again is they're, they're argument is that this has been uh, used in Japan. They've got about 100 installations outside the United States. This is the first time they're really showing in the United States trying to make a product out of it. The fact is that it, it is, uh, this kind of imaging is done, but it's not done in the interventional radiology suite. It's typically you do the IR uh, procedure, take that patient out, that patient may go back to his or her room, then go to CT and then go back if necessary to go back into an interventional procedure, have another interventional procedure done. Mm -hmm. And uh, within uh, CT trends, uh, over the past year we've just been deluged at ITN with uh, releases and studies and news on lung CT cancer oh, yeah. screening. And I, I think that's been uh, reflected here on the show floor, show floor with both uh, visualization software and messages, uh, especially since CMS is now reimbursing. Well, you can see this, and, and it was a decision November 10th that, that Medicare decided to reimburse mm -hmm. uh, for lung cancer screening. But you have to look at the specifics involved in lung cancer screening. Uh, it's very, very uh, specific to the age, 74 and younger. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to do this, the eligible programs have to follow the guidelines by, that have been established by CMS, which say take advantage of the mortality uh, the, um, gains that were, were shown in the 2011 National Lung Screening Trial. And these involve accreditation, shared uh, decision-making visits, radiation dose monitoring, national registries use, nodule follow-up, biopsy of, spe of suspicious uh, mm -hmm. lesions. So you really need to be able to put the program together. Uh, something else that uh, has come about is uh, dual source, uh, dual energy spectral imaging. Yeah. And uh, Siemens Healthcare with its dual source system has been pushing this for several years. Uh, now all of the vendors uh, that offer CT have some sort of uh, iteration of spectral imaging. And uh, a couple weeks ago, you had uh, Philips Healthcare that just got its FDA approval for its uh, icon system, mm -hmm. which is going to take spectral imaging to the next level, according to Philips, mm -hmm. to be able to image for specific uh, uh, calcium or iodine mapping within a system. But you could also do non-contrast images by just subtracting the contrast that's in a system using spectral imaging, Absolutely. which is a very interesting concept. Yeah. And I think these applications are in their infancy still, even though they've been experimenting with this for several years. Mm -hmm. uh, but Siemens is going forward with this technology. They have the force, which mm -hmm. they, they showed as a uh, as the uh, a work in progress last year as the uh, successor uh, to their uh, flash unit. So that here's a dual beam, dual energy system. Uh, the definition edge upgraded version of that is a single beam uh, dual energy where they split the beam and have different energy uh, and again the the key here is how to use it you know what applications proved value and again this lends itself to a value-based medicine where you are able to create a diagnosis uh, out of uh, data sets that have been acquired at different energies. And I think that that is really what you need to be able to do is to show the advantage of doing that. But uh, another uh, key CT uh, development is the Revolution CT, mm -hmm. which GE has brought out. They had as a work in progress last year. And like the Icon, it has a very large detector. And so you're talking about single organ coverage as well. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing the, I think that... Uh, 256. Exactly. Well, you're looking at, at 
even up to 640. Mm -hmm. And Aquilion One set this standard some five, seven years ago mm -hmm. uh, with its, when it was brought out. And now it has the Aquilion One family where you can go from 320 to 640 mm -hmm. slices uh, in the field upgrade. And the rapid speed of rotation, 0.28 seconds on the Aquilion One, as well as the Revolution CT, you're talking about a system now that can capture a, even a, someone who has a rapid heartbeat. So I think that the cardiac side and also the brain perfusion side are leading into those kinds of applications that really can show some value. Right. And with CT, and you can see it all over the show floor with the key CT vendors, is that uh, every single vendor now has uh, a series or a family of uh, well-established CT systems uh, in, in various price ranges. That will become very important in the coming years because of uh, replacement. Look at this, our last real big surge, what, what was the peak of the CT market was 2005, 2006. And this was when the 64 slice CTs first came out and they were adopted and it had been, that had been the successor to the 16 slice which had been the successor to the quad slice. Mm -hmm. So you saw this, this ramping up. And when you hit 64 you hit a point whereby going beyond it you were, your, your gains were limited. Mm -hmm. And as a result you had a lot of of uh, purchasing and installation of these 64 slides. That was back, that was eight years ago, it's hard to believe, but seven to eight years ago when these were purchased. All of these in the install base that people have been holding on to past the usual five to six years that they had been right. at that time or even less. So they, so you're coming up with all of these factors, this convergence of factors with lung cancer screening, uh, the potential for uh, you know lower dose mm -hmm. and, and, and improved safety health kind of uh, patient concerns, mm -hmm. uh, as well as your um, dual energy, multi uh, energy spectral mm -hmm. imaging as if you're going to be looking to a new purchase and whole organ imaging and what you can gain from that and you can get a good return on investment when you look at whole organ uh, either through the stroke or through the cardiac assessments. So I think that if you look at the potential out there we could be seeing some rejuvenation of that CT marketplace. And one of the final areas I wanted to touch on was uh, X-ray and ultrasound, uh, the other parts of the bread and butter for RSNA. Uh, I think one of the trends that both of us have seen on the show floor has uh, been where these traditional film companies that are very entrenched with DR or X-ray uh, have started to expand their uh, modalities into ultrasound. Well, then you look at that too. We were talking about this, and it's a circular uh, kind of discussion here because we began in talking about information technologies and how film was really the storage medium mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of decades ago, and that was a natural. Uh, segue for these companies to go into the electronic storage, which of course became our PACs and then mm -hmm. now is becoming enterprise-wide imaging uh, storage and dis distribution. But as these were literally the PACs companies, early PACs companies, many of them uh, were film companies before that and as a result they have a grounding in radiology. Mm -hmm. They went naturally into CR, then into DR, mm -hmm. and they became primary imaging uh, companies when they have continued that that diversification now are getting into ultrasound. You take a look at CareStream, mm -hmm. uh, they're there for that. Konica Minolta is there for that. Uh, and you take a look, and Fujifilm has purchased Sonosite. So they're there for that as well. So you have this development, this natural growth in these relatively low barrier to entry kinds of modalities. Mm -hmm. And it, it, really, it really reflects where these companies have been. With uh, CareStream, instead of coming out with a uh point of care system, which would have been a, the first step forward, they decided to go right for the throat and go for a, a, a high-end ultrasound system. But not only did they go for a high-end ultrasound system, they also introduced the, uh, the touch system, which yeah. is the very first uh, completely touch interface screen. Uh, there's no tracking ball. Everything is with uh, finger motions. The keyboard and everything is in sealed cases, so you could wipe it clean for infection control. Mm -hmm. uh, very innovative for a first uh, first attempt. Innovative, and I think that they probably looked at it, and this is again going back to that family concept, mm -hmm. because they they are expecting to come out in the third quarter with not only just one of these units, but they expect to come out with two. So this is starting from the top and working yourself down. Mm -hmm. And I thought when I first saw it that the touch screen was very innovative, but when you drop over by Sonosite, Sonosite has their export, mm -hmm. which you remember was set up, it was an outgrowth from their edge, mm -hmm. which was a hand carried unit. The export is a cart based unit, mm -hmm. and it too uses a, a touch screen for a keyboard. Mm -hmm. so 
one of the other pieces that I saw with uh, ultrasound. You had the touch screen, which uh, has the outgrowth from the uh, the iPad uh, iPhone generation, and. Uh, Going hand in hand to that would be uh, your pocket uh, iPhone type uh, mm -hmm. ultrasound system, yeah. and this show uh, has really kind of brought out that new revolution. In the next couple of years, you're probably going to see a huge proliferation of these systems. Uh, GE came out with the V Scan a couple of years ago. This show, they're showing a, a dual probe system where you can flip the probe over, and you have a, a linear probe on one side, you have a deep probe on the other. And uh, Konica Minolta has its P3, a pocket ultrasound system, a little bit larger than an iPhone, about the size of a cell phone. Uh, there's a French company here that has a, a system uh, a little bit smaller than an iPad that uh, is pending 510K right now. And Philips is introducing a app-based ultrasound system where you could... Uh, uh, download an app into your iPad hmm. and you could just, uh, the transducer actually has all the technology directly in the transducer to make it into an ultrasound system. Very interesting too because you see this proliferation of of uh, capabilities mm -hmm. and that you just mentioned that this is turning an iPhone into an ultrasound scanner and it just shows you the kind of computing power that mm -hmm. is on board those iPhones. And you start to wonder because if we look at the way that, that iPhones and, and, and cell phones have gone, they've gotten bigger and bigger. You mm -hmm. take a look at the uh, iPhone 6 Plus, mm -hmm. which is really like a mini tablet almost because of the display space on there. And one of the things we were talking about with universal viewers is that because the display space is getting larger, people are getting less concerned about having good enough quality images to diagnose from. Mm -hmm. So you're getting, you're trying to find this sweet spot where the displays are large enough to give people the confidence and give them the images that they need in order to do the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And you're also at the same time providing more and more computing power so you can do the kinds of things with apps of all things, right? An app for, for ultrasound. So a good catch on that one. And uh, which will segue us hopefully into RSNA 2015 when we can start to see the elimination of workstations and everybody <laughs> working off their tablets. So. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you.